We are glad you can join us today for our noontime chat on spring ornamental gardening. I'm Laura Iyer and today I will be sharing some information on what to do in your spring garden. For those of you who are not familiar, the Tenement University trademark includes short classes, videos, and handouts on essential gardening information for you, the home gardener. Oregon State University owns the trademark and Clackamas County Master Gardeners develop and manage the program. Today's class is the 14th in a series of 21 webinars. With the help of these webinars, we hope to help you master your home garden. For the complete lineup, please visit the Clackamas County Master Gardeners website. The handout for this presentation is Spring Gardening Tips, which you can download from our website. Today, Priscilla Robinson will co-host and facilitate the question and answer following the presentation. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. We will be monitoring and posting pertinent links in the chat box. Today, our objectives are to discover what to do in your garden, clean up, find out how to dig a hole and place a plant, understand pruning techniques, learn how to prune different shrubs and grasses, and learn about preparing a compost pile, getting your lawn in shape, and how to control spring pests. So spring is the best of times and it's the worst of times. The nurseries are beginning to fill with a few warm days. Everything smells so good. People have been reading the catalogs and you're ready. And yet, depending on what is happening with our weather, it could be the worst of times to start working in your garden and destroying the soil tilth. Tilth means the soil has the proper structure and the nutrients to grow healthy plants. You want to wait until the soil is no longer wet enough to form a ball before you walk on it or compact it or start working in it. In most years, Portland averages a daily maximum temperature of 61 degrees in April. The minimum temperature usually averages to 44 degrees and we average 18 days of rain in April. When I first became a master gardener, our zone, our zone was seven, which means that our plants can withstand a minimum temperature of zero to 10 degrees. Then as time goes by, we're now kind of classified as zone eight, which means that our plants can withstand a minimum temperature of 10 to 20 degrees. That also means we can grow plants that are higher, like maybe zone 10 or zone 11 and they might survive the winter. It's called zonal denial. But do start your cleanup before the old growth gets tangled up with your new growth. Many perennials actually prefer to be left standing in the winter, which protects the crown and the roots. So if you start to see new growth come up, now's the time to cut back all that winter stuff that you left up. It's important to allow the foliage of spring flowering bulbs to brown and die off before you cut them off. And this allows photosynthesis to happen, which then feeds the roots for the, for the bulb for the next year. Proactive weeding. Damp soil makes it so much easier to get rid of young weeds. But don't compost weeds if you have sick flowers or seed heads, because our home, post, home compost systems generally do not get hot enough to kill those weeds. Perennial weeds live for many years, so dig them up or kill them with a systemic herbicide. Dandelion seeds can travel 30 feet with the wind. Annual weeds grow one season, so removing them before they set weeds, set seeds or flowers 
really helps control your weeds. It's time to stake your perennials. And it's so much easier to stake them before uh, the new growth comes up and then you have to bend in the slender stems to fit whatever staking mechanism you use. So dahlias, peonies, crocosmia, shasta daisies, and asters really benefit from staking so they don't flop over and look messy in your garden. It's time to plant or transplant. So now we're going to talk about how to dig a hole and place a plant. The photo on the right shows how we used to dig a hole for a plant, the way we were taught in Master Gardeners a long time ago. The instructions were to dig a hole twice as deep and twice as wide as the root ball. But new research has shown us now what to do for a successful planting. The planting hole should be the same depth as your root ball. This is the big change and at least twice its width. And you wanna dig your hole so that it looks like a shallow bowl. Remove all the rooks, rocks. I found horseshoes in the garden in the hole sometimes. Remove all of that. And then break up the excavated native soil that you've dug out into small pieces because you will use this soil to backfill around your new root ball, placing the plant. So now you have your shallow hole, take some of that excavated roots and make a mound. And on that mound, you will place the roots of the plant that you're going to put in your hole. And you wanna spread out your roots so that they look like a, the rays of a starfish. Then make sure that the crown of the plant is just above the soil surface so you do not want to bury it. Water well, let drain, backfill with more soil, pat it down gently because you don't want to destroy the air passages and the water pores for the plant. The next three shy slides are going to show you when you take a tree out of a container, what the root ball looks like and then what to do. So in this one, the planting medium is being washed away from the root ball. Now we can see what the roots look like. So some are circling, which is a very bad thing. Some are pointing up. And none of these are going to allow us to have a healthy plant with a good strong root ball. So what we're gonna do is take them all off. It's kind of shocking, I know. But now the roots can grow straight out like a uh, the rays of a starfish and be healthy. And all those fine filaments that you see are the feeder roots, which are good for the plant. This is another version. This is a grass that's just been removed from its container. And see how the roots are growing straight up? We don't want those. And see that mat at the bottom of the root ball? We've got to get that off so that the roots can grow straight down and out. So what we're going to do is take either your shovel or a knife or a machete and just slice off that mass. And then see still on the root ball itself how some roots are still going up. We're going to pull those away. And usually I can do that with my fingers. You want to spread them out. The next step is to wash away all the potting medium that the root ball came with because you're going to plant the plant in native soil. You don't want any of that potting medium left. So wash it away again gently. So now look how wide that root ball is and how deep it is. It's so much different than what it was in the container. It's all fluffy. So now you're gonna put that on top of the mound, backfill with native soil. You'll have a good healthy plant for a long time. So the definition of mulch is anything you put on top of your soil. The defini definition of a soil amendment is anything that you dig into your soil. They can be the same material, it's just how you use them makes the difference in the meaning. So we know that mulch is, conserves water, cools the plant roots during the summer, feeds the soil, 
and smothers weeds. You want to mulch after the soil has warmed up because as you know, the soil act, the mulch acts as an insulator. So if you put the mulch on too early, say last month when the soil hasn't really warmed up, you all, it's not bad. All you've done is delay the warmth of the soil then the microorganisms wake up later and the roots kind of come away awake later. It's not bad, it's just be aware of it. So I uh, measure my soil temperature and I use this uh, compost thermometer. It's about two feet long. So, and I put it down to where the roots are. And this morning when I did it, and I always do it at the same time, always on the north side because that's my coolest point. And today my soil was 50 degrees. That means everything is ready. And I can tell because stuff is starting to grow. All my herbaceous plants are beginning to grow. So when you put mulch around, the recommended amount is about four inches. And you don't mix it into the soil, you just lay it right on top. And you put it around your trees and shrubs. And it's thick enough so that when you walk on it, it does not compact your soil. But you want to feather it to the trunk or the plant stems that come out of the crown so that the mulch does not touch the, the crown or the trunk. And the reason is if you do that, then it's easier for vermin and pathogens to attack your plant. Now we're going to talk about ornamental garden plants, my favorite. But first I wanna talk about, I'm gonna use a lot of Latin with the common names and specific Latin names are used as a means of classifying and identifying a plant. There are many common names out there and they kind of vary uh, throughout our, the country, depending on which area you live in. But if you have the Latin name, which identifies a specific plant then everybody knows which plant you're talking about. And I also wanted to define um, the different plant types. So evergreen plants means that the plant stays, has its leaves all year round. Deciduous means that it has a woody top growth and the plants fall off during the fall. Herbaceous means that it has a soft top growth and it dies completely to the ground in the fall. Time to clean up your annuals and perennials. So if you didn't um, pull out your annuals from last year, now's the time. You're gonna see damage from the winter on your plants, like the frost damage on the cucara at the, in the top left or winter damage on the azalea. Clip those leaves off because they will never recover. And then you get a brand new plant, looks good with no damage. And on the right hand side, azalea leaf bug damage and rust. And I want to recommend Jane Collier's talk next week on April 14th. And she's going to talk about spring pests and diseases. And she's going to cover this subject thoroughly. Some plants self sowed last fall. And after the seedlings come up in the spring, then you can decide if you want them there, if you need to edit them out, or maybe you'd like to keep a few just to create, create a, a band of color for yourself. So sweet peas, sun, uh, sunflowers, columbine, annual delphiniums, poppies, calendula, nasturtiums, clarkia, alyssum, and sometimes even petunias can be nurtured to come back. Dill, fennel, and cilantro are willing self-sowers in the herb family, especially if the seed heads are come, left on the plant. So edit them before they come out of, become out of hand. There are self -so some self-sowing plants that kind of thugs. And you go, uh-oh. So verbena bonariensis, I've actually seen this plant take over a field. Uh, because the homeowner didn't cut off the flowers soon enough before they went to seed. And amaranthus, caudatus, or love lies bleeding. And the way you can always tell this plant, because the flower lays down on the leaf and looks like a bleeding wound. That self sows very much. 
Bronze fennel is one of my favorite self-sewing plants and it does self-sew a lot, but I love the size, it gets about five feet. I love the bronze color in a garden because that's a, a color you don't see very much and it smells so good. But the seedlings are so obvious, they're very easy to identify and then pull out if you don't want them. Pruning ornamentals. So pruning demonstrates both the art and the science of horticulture. So understanding how plants grow and why pruning is necessary can really solve the mystery of pruning. Ornamental plants are pruned for many reasons. Some are pruned routinely to maintain a desired shape or size. Others are pruned to promote healthy, vigorous growth or flowering. And plants damaged by insects, disease, or injury may require corrective pruning. We'll go into all of this. But maybe one of the most important things is to know your plant. What's the name of it? Because that will tell you when it flowers, how to prune it, and its growth habit. So there, in the past, there's been three Ds of pruning. Disease, dead, and damaged. And then at a seminar last year, I found a new one, it's called deranged. I like that. It means a, a branch is going sideways. So now we're gonna talk about the main types of pruning cuts. Probably the most important thing to remember about pruning is that it's governed by apical dominance. Apical dominance means the branch tip creates hormones to suppress the buds from below the growth. So in the slide, the active, active apical bud is that thin top bud. The dormant lateral buds on the side are waiting to come out. The terminal bud creates that hormone called auxin, which prevents those dormant lateral buds from blooming, coming out. And usually that hormone is active for this first six to eight inches on a stem. So see what happens when you clip off that abical bud, all those latent buds come out. So on a heading cut, it's called tip pruning. So you remove the hormone and you get a really bushy plant. A thinning cut means that you removed a branch or a twig by cutting at the point of origin, either at the ground level or the parent branch. Thinning cuts in Thinning cuts result in more open plants so you can see the structure. And many plants have beautiful structure that's lovely to look at, but it also allows sun and air to get within the plant. Hedges are used pri primarily as a privacy screen. So after you plant your hedge, however many plants that is, begin pruning early so that you can get that compact growth. And so you would be using heading, heading cuts to achieve that look. Then once the hedge uh, reaches the height that you want, then you get to make a decision. So do you want an informal hedge or do you want a formal hedge? An informal hedge assumes a natural growth habit and then you prune only as needed for the four Ds, damaged, dead, diseased, or deranged. If you decide to have a formal hedge, you're gonna be pruning several times during the year to achieve that crisp look that a formal hedge likes. But in both cases, whether you use an informal style or a formal style, you wanna have the hedge shaped in a very gentle pyramid where it's narrower at the top and then comes down a little bit wider at the bottom. And what that does is allow adequate light 
to reach the canopy at the lower level. And as a result, you have foliage all the way to the ground. The 45 degree rule is another one of those general rules that's important to know. You want your pruning cut to be at a 45 degree angle. So the green check mark shows you the right way. The cut is away from the bud and is a wee bit higher than the union of the bud to the branch. The first red X, the cut is too low below the bud. The second red X, the 45 degree angle cut is going into the uh, bud. And that means water, either from irrigation or rain, will flow into that bud and could make it mushy. It's not good for that bud. The third red X, you've pruned too high and you've left an ugly stub that you'll need to come back later and correct. When not to prune is as important as when to prune. When the sap is flowing and right now with spring and the trees are budding out and the flowers are coming, not a good time to prune. Also, not during hot, dry weather because the plant is under stress during excess, excessively cold temperatures below 25 degrees or pruning at the time of planting or transplanting because remember all that work we did in the roots, it's under stress already. Wait until it settles in and starts to put on new growth and then you can take off and prune maybe branches that didn't look right. Really important, just prior to flowering, you don't wanna prune off the new buds. So depending on where you're growing, gardening, some perennial plants never go quite dormant, but they may still need tidying up. Plants like epimediums, heucheras, hellebores, and ferns all come in, in this class. So spring is the time to trim back that tattered winter damaged foliage and encourage new growth to come in. So on epimediums and hellebores, they, they flower on thin stems that come up from the ground. So as soon as I start seeing those thin stems, then it's my um, key to prune out all the winter damage. And sometimes I take off all the old leaves because the new leaves are coming out. And pretty soon you have this wonderful new plant with the flowers just above. The same thing with the hellebores. And ferns often get one or two fronds that just don't, didn't like the winter and all brown. Cut that off. And heucheras, which are the common name is coral bells. See how the, the flowers come up on the top on those really thin wires. But most of the damage ha happens on the bottom where the leaves rest on the ground. So just cut the, those all away and you'll have a brand new plant. Pruning herbaceous plants. This is cool because your work is already done. You did it back fall and you just have uh, need to rake up any grass that you didn't quite. So Hack and Chloe are, is that yellow grass, Monarda, Bee Balm, and still be in Hostas. All these plants are just about two or three inches in my garden and I can't wait. Grasses come in evergreen, deciduous, and herbaceous. And many have lovely seed heads in the fall, especially the evergreen and the deciduous. And I leave those, the flowers are called fluorescence in an ornamental grass. And I leave them up because they, they look so pretty when the frost is on them and the birds like them. But sometimes your uh, evergreen grass does need pruning. And as a rule, you don't prune them hard, meaning that you don't take them to the ground every year. And the reason for that is you destroy the vigor. You can do it maybe every four or five years if you just need to give the plant a new start in life. But usually you just take a rake or I use a three prong fork or sometimes my hands and I pull out all the dead grass. The key is to do it gently so you don't lift the plant ball from the ground. Another way, if you have a really thick mound of grass, you take it up in like a ponytail, hold it and then you clip off the dead ends, maybe one to two inches, all the way around and then open it up and you've got a clean new plant. 
The next slide shows how to do this too. So in the middle, see how it's, the grass is wrapped with a bungee cord. You can do that with your evergreen class grasses. Um, Miscanthus sinensis morning light is my favorite large grass because it's got long green leaves with a white stripe right down the middle. It gets five by five and the flowers, the fluorescence are about six feet tall. So it's a wonderful plant. This is too big for me to do with my hand. So I do use a bungee cord and electric saw to get through it. Miscanthus sinensis gold bar was developed by jo um, Joy Creek Nursery in Scapoos by Morris Horn. And it's really neat because it has green and gold stripes up. It's a columnar grass. I think it's about five feet tall. So it's best to prune deciduous grasses in the spring when you see the new shoots just barely coming up and mine are about three inches. So when I prune, I prune just above the new growth because you don't want to cut off the new growth and then let it go. And in deciduous grasses, they get that gray um, straw-like look. And sometimes in the winter, you just can't stand it anymore. You can take it off any time that you want. Herbaceous grasses, good. They come out all brand new. You don't have to do any work. These are two of my favorite. Hacachlore aureola is a shade uh, grass. It thrives in shade and not many grasses do. So it's got a green leaf with yellow and white in it. They can get about three feet wide. Hack and Chloe All Gold is a pure sun plant and it's this beautiful bright yellow grass that just shines in your garden. It may be that your grass has gotten too big for its uh, spot. So an easy way to do it is take your shovel and dig half of it out. The root ball is really heavy and this makes it much easier to handle. So now you're at a point of decision. So you can leave the original plant there, backfill with native soil and take your other plant and put it elsewhere or toss it. Step two is looking at the native plant I mean, the original plant is already in the ground. The native plant is out there and you can plant it. Or in step three, you can divide it into quarters or thirds and have free plants that you put in around a garden. Evergreen conifers rarely need any pruning except to tidy up any damaged uh, foliage or the deranged foliage that goes sideways. Pruning conifers in a hedge, you have to proceed with caution. And this is an important tool. Conifers will only put out new shoots from green wood. So if the conifer is used as a hedge plant and you're pruning it down, you can only prune in the green part. If you prune in the brown wood, new growth does not regenerate from that. You will have a brown spot forever. Pruning keeps trees and shrubs in shape, gets rid of dead and diseased wood and encourages new growth. So you prune deciduous plants so that their structures are revealed. Remove branches where two, two branches rub together. Remove the branch stubs that you didn't remove before. Remove suckers coming up from the roots or low on the trunk and remove vigorous uh, branches called water sprouts from the ground. They're very obvious because they come straight out. Be aware that pruning spring bloomers set their flower buds the previous year. This is incredibly important. Some examples are Daphne, Camellia, Rhodes, Azaleas, Forsythia, Mock Orange, flowering quince, dutsi, and lilac. So when I work with clients whose gardens I've done, sometimes they'll come to me and say, Laura, my plant is broken. It doesn't prune it, bloom anymore. So we have a conversation and I'll say, um, when did you prune? Let's go through that. And because the plant really looks good, like they've taken really good care of it. And then when I 
tell them that the plant sets bloom immediately after flowering are ah, the moment. And so I say, let's leave this plant. We won't touch it for a year or even longer. And next year they come and say, Laura, it worked. I feel brilliant. So Wygella, Wine and Roses, is one of my favorite uh, Wygellas because it's got burgundy leaves and hot pink flowers. It blooms on wood from the previous year. So when you prune this is immediately after blooming. All lavenders bloom on stems that grow in the current year. This means pruning can be done mid-spring. Now I pruned mine last, year, last week without sacrificing the current year's flowers. Uh, pruning this late may delay my flowering, but I don't care because when the plant comes back, the plant itself looks really good. And it's a good time to take up portions that are dead. Pruning hardy fuchsias is different than uh, the annual fuchsias that you find in the hanging containers. You, those ones you just uh, toss at the end of the year. But hardy fuchsias come back year after year. And they bloom only on new wood. So you can prune them back now because the new wood really hasn't started coming out yet. And you can take them down to three or four inches, what I've done when I want to completely renovate the plant. Or I've just done tip pruning because I like the size and the shape of the hardy fuchsia. But they're really cool because then you have these great big um, shrubs and blossoms all, all season. In the Erica family, which includes Heather and Luna, Erica group. The Mediterranean white blooms uh, now. And so you prune right after blooming. If you wait any longer, then you'll cut off the new, the new growth. In Kaluna, you really don't ever need to prune. And usually heathers are pruned like a mushroom cap. Kalunas, you don't need to prune because they're grown because they have all that spiky flowers and look so cool. And then here's the, the important key on pruning uh, heathers or colunas. You only prune down enough so that you have green foliage underneath. That means you haven't gotten into the old wood because they're the same as conifers. If you get into that old wood, the plant will not regenerate from that old wood. So we have a 10 minute um, Master Gardener video on pruning hydrangeas that you can go to our website and download and watch. When hydrangeas get old and woody, it can produce smaller blooms. So regular removal of the oldest canes at the soil line can keep your sh shrubs vigorous and producing large and abundant flowers. What you're doing is you're re um, renovating your plant year after year. And you can tell the old canes because they're usually gray with kind of black spots or they look like a straw. And you can usually snap them off at the bottom or use your shears. But timing is everything when you prune any hydrangea and it's really important to know what kind you have. So arborescence and paniculata hydrangeas bloom only on buds on new stems produced during the current growing season. So as long as you prune when the flower buds are not in coming out, then you're pretty safe. Paniculatas and arborescents have great big blooms and they're heavy. So when you're pruning back the stem, leave a kind of a sturdy stem so that the new growth, which is kind of wimpy, doesn't pull down the the uh, new stem and break. You want to have a nice strong stem for these buds to bloom on. Macrophyllas and serratas are probably the most common hydrangeas around and Mauricii is my favorite of the, hydra of the macrophyllas. This one's a hard one. The flower beds formed during late summer and early fall. 
to bloom next spring. So if you prune in winter or early spring, you've lost all your buds. And I've done this and it's true. And I've had to wait a whole year for new buds, new blooms. So the key is to remove the risk of removing those buds, prune just as the flowers begin to fade. If you do this constantly, then you never have to worry about, about losing the next year's buds. Quercifolias are just stunning. Quercus is the Latin name for oak tree. So quercifolia means oak leaf. And you can always tell a quercifolia because the leaves look like oak leaves. And quercifolias bloom on old wood. So you only want to remove the dead branches and flowers. And if you prune them as they die, then you always have a nice looking plant. The neat thing about quercifolias is that in the fall, they have this tremendous bronze orangey color, just like an oak leaf. I chose this slide on pruning roses because it has that crab spider in it. And the crab spiders are actually a bigger problem for insects than they actually are for your roses. What they do is they nestle in the petals and stake out uh, their territory. Unfortunately, they eat bees, but more importantly, they eat leaf hoppers and leaf hoppers chew away at the leaves of the rose plant. So in a way, it's a beneficial predator. And we have a video on this and you can go to the Clackamas County website, 10 Minute University, go to video section and go to the pruning roses. So on hybrids and grandifloras, as a general rule in the fall, you pruned down the long canes so that they don't whip around in the winter winds and get break. And then in the spring, you come in and do your main pruning, usually in early February and March. You prune to a vase shape, an open interior, and you prune to an outside bulb. With shrub roses, they generally flower on older wood. And so they, if you just let them develop naturally, and then you can kind of prune to take out the old canes. So now's the time to send your mower and leaf blower for servicing, get your blades sharpened on the mower, clear your yawn of winter debris and look for areas that need receding before mowing. The time to dethatch and renovate your garden. Oregon State recommends a mix of 70 to 80% perennial ryegrass and a 20 to 30% mixture of fine fescue. So this combination will make your lawn a rugged lawn, one that can tolerate some shade, requires medium to high fertility initially to look good, and is fairly easy to cut. Now is the optimum time to prune your, to fertilize your lawn. You apply one pound nitrogen to 1,000 square feet of lawn. If you don't have a compost pile or a bin, now's the time to start one. Begin by collecting plant debris and leaves raked up from the garden. Add two parts brown, which is carbon rich material, like dried leaves, um, straw, to one part green, which is nitrogen rich materials like grass clippings and fresh prunings from your garden to the pile. Most life needs water to, and air to survive. So the microorganisms and the macroorganisms that are in your pile need um, water and oxygen. And they work best when the pile is damp like a run out sponge. So if these organisms that are in your compost pile have more surface area to feed on, then your compost will happen quicker. So that's why shredding 
or chopping up your garden debris helps get you a compost pile, compost faster. Sometimes I just throw my prunings onto the lawn and have, go over it with the lawnmower and then put that into the compost pile. So now we're looking at three different kinds of compost bins. The three bin compost system is kind of the Cadillac. You put your new plant debris in bin number one. And then as it gets full, you pull out the slats and dig out the compost that's semi-composted and then put everything back in. So now the new, the stuff that you now, the stuff that you dug out from bin number one is now in bin number two, is decomposing more. And then when it's fully decomposed, decomposed, you put it in the fully composted bin number three. And then you put it in your wheelbarrow, you spread it around your garden, you've got a lovely mixture. The key is turning regularly so that all this stuff gets mixed around. And the neat thing about doing a compost yourself is you know that there's no chemicals in there, there's no weed seeds, and there's no diseased plants. The black bin is uh, usually used for garden uh, kitchen compost uh, because uh, vermin can't get into it easily like rats and raccoons. The problem is, as you can tell from the other two bins, is that it doesn't have much ability to get air into it. So it's really important to turn it regularly and to add brown stuff like um, le dead leaves and um, old straw things so that you get that carbon mix because when this bin gets too heavy in nitrogen or it goes anaerobic, it smells to high heaven. So the key is to turn regularly and add enough brown stuff or carbon rich material to mix with your green stuff because almost all kitchen garbage is considered green and it's full of water. The wire bin down at the bottom is the one I used in my garden because I could open it up. I could turn it easily. It wasn't too heavy for me. And I had three in a row and I just mixed them up from new, semi, and fully composted. You want to disinfect your feeders by scrubbing with a weak bleach um, solution of one quarter cup bleach to two gallons warm water. Rinse and dry the feeders thoroughly before refilling them. Use that same combina bleach combination to clean out your bird baths. And then you um, add water regularly, probably in the summer with evaporation, you'll fill it every day. This is a, uh, these bird houses are made by a master gardener and her father. They're made out of metal, so they're not good for birds and they have wire netting in front of the hole so that the birds can't get in. And this master gardener, her whole yard has the colors of green, purple, and blue. And so all these birdhouses just mimic the colors in her garden and it looks fabulous. So behind them is a park and it's road regularly. Underneath the birdhouses, she's planted Veronica with uh, purple flowers. So when in the summer, when these are in bloom, this is just a stunning sight. So snails and slugs are one of the biggest pests that you're gonna find right now because they've just hatched and they're hungry. And I did a slug and snail video a couple weeks ago and it's available um, on the, at the Clackamas County website under videos. What you wanna do is to be sure, identify the problem that you actually have slug and snails and not something else. And then use cultural, physical and biological controls before you go to the chemicals. And remember Jane Collier is going to have spring pests and disease uh, talk on April 14th. And she'll go into much more detail on spring pests. Here are some of the chemical and um, excuse me, cultural and physical controls. Plant selection, optimum timing of irrigation, 
water in the morning, not at night, because you don't want your garden damp at night because slugs and snails love a damp, dark environment. Elimination of habitat, meaning that all your debris is cleaned up so that the slugs and snails don't have a place to hide or lay their eggs. Manual removal, destruction of eggs, and trapping and exclusion by barriers. So on commercial control, metalldehyde products and iron phosphate products are out there. And the way you can tell what you're getting is to read the label and the first ingredient will be the active ingredient. So metalldehyde works by the rapid destruction of mucus pr production abilities in a slug or snail, which there by reducing their mobility, digestion, and promotes dehydration, which in, in effect kills the slug or snail. This is very dangerous to dogs, cats, birds, and fish, and it's not recommended for use around edible vegetables. Iron phosphate products work by destroying the um, calcium metabolism, metabolism in their gut so they feel full, so they stop eating which is the whole point. And they, you can use um, iron phosphate products around food and berry products up until the day of harvest. Um, and the way that you spread it out is you scatter it like seed, little, little tiny white pellets. And that way you're uh, attracting the most snail and slugs that you can. Thank you and happy gardening. Questions, please visit www.cmastergardeners.org for these 10 minute university handouts. And these are all the 10 minute handouts that I use in preparing this uh, talk. Hi, Priscilla. Hey, Laura, that was awesome. Your garden looks beautiful. I can just imagine all those little perennials just start <laughs> to poke their heads out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've uh, had a couple questions come in, and the first one is about pruning lavender and rosemary. That may need to be two separate questions. And um, Leah wants to know, will, um, will lavender and rosemary regenerate from old wood? Not easily. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, you, I kind of follow the same rule that I do with Heather and Kaluna not growing into that brown wood because they regenerate from new growth. And that I would just use that as the guideline. Sometimes, especially with lavender, unless you've pruned it regularly and um, to a nice shape, it's just sometimes it's better to start over if you don't like what your lavender looks like. And rosemary constantly gets pruned because you're using it in your garden, in your cooking. So it's kind of self-fulfilling. Okay, great. And uh, Michael wants to know, when should you prune Daphne? When is mm. Daphne pruned? You see more mistakes on Daphne and azaleas than almost any plant, a spring blooming plant. You, that's where this three week window comes into to use. So what you do, as soon as your Daphne stops blooming, you have about three weeks to prune within that window. After that, don't, because the flower buds have already formed for the following year. So in commercial um, buildings, this is where you usually see hedges of, of uh, azaleas, usually hino, the variety called hino, and all the flowers are in the interior because they've been pruned according to a landscaper schedule, not to the plant schedule. And that's why that you get that odd look. All right, Michael, you got a very narrow window. Yep. So, uh, it, and you know, there's different Daphnes. You could almost have enough Daphnes to bloom throughout the summer. There are that many of the varieties. So just pay attention. If they're blooming now, uh, probably by the end of April, early May, they'll be done. That's the time to go in and renovate the plant if you want. As a general rule, Daphnes don't require much, uh, much pruning unless you've got damage. Okay. Um, how and when to prune Carex, C-A-R-E-X? 
So carex is a, usually an evergreen grass. So that's one of the ones that you would use a gentle rake or your hands. And I have several and I, they're usually small enough plants right now for me that I can grab them with my hand. Then I just take my clippers and clip off all the winter growth. And it's usually one or two inches. And they're usually the grass tips that, let, that hit the ground. That's the ones that, that, those are the ones that look bad. And there were a few questions that came in earlier about um, soil conditioner versus soil amendments. Um, uh, would they be used interchangeably? What, what's your recommendation? So the <laughs> definition of mulch is anything you put on top. It, a definition of a soil amendment is anything you put, you dig in. It depends completely on what you're digging in and what your goal is. So if you're using, um, if you want to renovate your soil, uh, you could dig in your compost and then it would be a soil amendment. If you left your uh, mulch or your compost on top, which is what I do because it saves me work and it works anyway, then the rain and the irrigation wash the nutrients down into your soil. That is so interesting. I don't think people realize that really it's the process and how you're going to be working it in your garden that uh, determines if it's a, an amendment or if it's just a mulch. Right. Very interesting. Well, those are all the questions that have come in today. Um, the, the presentation was so comprehensive and I love your photos. Uh, I just think that uh, people need to get out and get growing. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's just perfect timing right now. Um, I'm, this is just a curiosity question. If people are thinking about renovating their garden, um, design is really important. Um, can you give them just a few of your maybe five uh, tips on uh, designing a, a new uh, garden? Mm -hmm. The first, and is probably the most important, is to make your beds wide enough, at least five to six feet, so that you can get two or three layers of plants in. That gives you the tapestry look, that gives you a full lush garden look, rather than a single architectural line. I've designed gardens for where they just want an architectural look, and it was a single line, usually one plant or one type of plant. However, and then once you get the butt, the bigger, the better, like eight feet would be very cool because then you can get very tall plants, your medium sized plants, your lower plants and your ground cover. And so you get that look. And another uh, thing to realize, unless you're doing an architectural garden, is um, pl don't plant in a straight line like soldiers. You plant in, the way I tell clients is you plant in like a W or a upside down W like an M so that you have triangle, triangles going. And that gives you again, that tapestry look. And one of the things I do when I go into a garden is I look for um, triangles and the, on the grand scale. So if I see a pop of red and it could be from a door or a pot, I look for a pop of red, maybe from um, Japanese lace leaf maple. Then I try to find a third point of red somewhere, or we put in a red plant, uh, like a burgundy, like the Wigella. And that way, what you're doing is you're creating triangles within your garden that even out the color, saturate, color saturation and make your garden feel finished, rather than having a bunch of yellow over here and a bunch of white over here. That, that's how you can mix in color into your garden and have it balanced. Um, that is, that's awesome. The biggest thing is when people want to make paths is the path is too narrow. And your path needs to be, if I'm walking down a path, the path should be about three feet because that way I can carry tools and new flowers, new plants in my hand and not touch. People, people have a real hang up about being touched with plants. So if you and I were walking down a path, the path should be five feet. 
That way we can walk comfortably together and not be touched. And another thing is talking about the path idea. You don't want thorny plants like barberry or roses that are gonna attack you or your guests. I could go on and on actually. Those are great. Hey, one last question came in and then I think we're gonna be wrapping up. What can I grow next to Arbor Vitae? V-I-T-A-E. Their roots are so shallow. I have no idea what to do. So um, I do that a lot. I mean, I, I plan against an arborvitae hedge a lot. What you want to do, it, well, you want, so figure out how tall your arborvitae is because you want to stair step down to the grass or ground level. What do you do? So if your arborvitae is pruned at 10 to 12 feet or even eight to 10 feet, then you want a plant that's like six feet. Okay, so you know a plant, is, I divide it by half, that's three feet. I don't want the three foot touching the arborvitae, so I come out a foot or foot and a half. And then you go three feet again because to get that six foot uh, width. This is getting math. And so by the time you've done that, you're oh, far enough away from the um, roots of the arborvitae. And what would be a good plant to put in there? Anything. So arborvitaes need full sun. So any plant that needs full, full sun. And I'm looking at my garden right now, and I have um, mock orange, abelia, sarco sarcococca, which needs more shade, and I uh, have garden art. All righty. That's a good, well, I, that's a good question. Yeah, I hope that's, that helps Rebecca. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, we have had a wonderful noontime chat and our topic today has just really given me some inspiration and I hope it gives our audience inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, just to remind you that we have recorded today's webinar and all of the uh, links have been posted in our chat box. So if there was something in particular, whether it be pruning roses or grasses, uh, those links were put into the chat box. So grab those so that you can uh, check out our 10 Minute University handouts and videos. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Priscilla. It was wonderful. All right, see you next time. Bye. Bye.